The Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. We'll have a link in the episode notes for your convenience. Many of the books mentioned here in the podcast are available in Audible. Sign up for a free 30-day membership trial and you can download any book you like. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. If our two eyes are not working together well as a fast, synchronized team, our internal map quest continues to be off. It's consistently inconsistent with our ability to judge time and space. Those that don't feel well grounded, those that have some measure of anxiety, oftentimes it starts in the visual system. If you can't move, look, and listen in a fast, accurate, effortless, sustainable, age-appropriate, meaningful way, you're in a world of hurt. There's a whole world in vision and how it affects brain function that no one's ever shared with you. 2020 is perceived as the holy grail of going to the eye doctor. Well, I'm here to change that paradigm. Welcome back yet once again to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. Our returning guest today is Mr. Alan Heath, psychologist and sensory processing guru. And today we're going to talk about the test of auditory visual skills. This has been a really fascinating thing for me personally. A number of years ago, I've gotten trained in several different music listening therapies. And one of the items that I always had questions about was how do we measure outcomes? And are we getting better at what we're trying to get better at? And namely, in particular, I was interested in some auditory parts of this therapy. And lo and behold, when I really started thinking about this, I became aware that Alan had worked with the advanced brain technologies folks, I think, over here in the U.S. to create and distribute the test of auditory visual skills. So, Alan, with that in mind, can you tell us a little bit about how that all came about, different than the movement program. Like, how did you get involved with creating this instrument for measuring these outcomes? Uh, okay, well, this this was a real team effort as well, really. So there was uh, involved mas- myself, who who led the team, and then a, an engineer in Scotland, a company over in Germany, and, and of course, ABT in the US as well. And it, it really came about... Because again, I we we have so many similarities because I've I've trained in in different auditory therapies over the years, and thinking, okay, how how can I actually test and measure outcomes in this? And there are lots of again, there are lots of auditory processing measures around. Um, so I use things like Scan Three that that people might know, which is certainly one of the the biggest uh, auditory processing measures around. The, the challenge being that it uses words. So I think there's, you know, there's lots of questions sometimes whether, whether something that uses words is measuring really fundamental levels of auditory processing or how, you know, how much language comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are all sorts of other individual measures around as well that measure things like um, duration or, or timing or pitch perception but they were all scattered all over. Um, now, when I when I looked at the um, American Speech Hearing Association and the American Academy of Audiology and the British Society of Audiology and looked at what they said about auditory processing, they recommend about nine different areas to, to assess. Um, four of them are done by scan, actually, so that was lovely. Um, and, I, and I could pick other tests to do to do these measures, but I thought, you know, wouldn't it be lovely if they were available in one? And, and essentially, it's as simple as that. Um, that you know, these are things that are relatively easy to measure and are, and are non-verbal, so they can be used in you know any language. It doesn't matter because it's about clicks, beeps, tones, and flashes. Um, so yeah, you know, you look at something like um, temporal processing or uh, 
um, auditory fusion and things like this. And and really the, the genesis of this project was just to bring all these different measures together in one simple machine. Well, I'm delighted to hear those comments because until you've just said that right now, it it kind of had gotten lost on me that measures like the scan uses language. Mm-hmm. And then there's the confounding parts of language and whether or not your outcomes might be, I don't know, diluted or misconceived because it's it's raising it to a higher level. And I find that particularly intriguing as a, I'll describe myself as a neuro or a behavior or developmental optometrist because there's a magnocellular vision piece that has to do with how fast we see or how slow we see, different than eye teaming, eye focusing, eye tracking, um, and certainly different than visual acuity, but there's magnocellular vision. And the thing I find so intriguing about magnocellular vision is that it's related to something called the McGurk effect, where we yeah. watch lip movements and it changes what we hear. Yes, I've come so, across that. It's so fascinating. Now you've got a, a vision piece in how we're able to see the speed of lip movements and have it affect an auditory outcome. And then I've got yeah. some research as recently as 2019, and maybe go back at least 10 years, probably further, quite honestly that ties in the magnocellular vision piece to the development of phonemic awareness and phonological processing. So I, I love the idea that the TAVs takes language out of the discussion. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, I just, if I can throw in one quick example of that as well. Now, scan, most most of the, the auditory speech-based ones, of course, are in American language as well. And even, you know, if you look if you look across the UK, I'm sure it's the same in America, there are so many different accents that you take any accent and, it, and that's a challenge. And then you, you look at individual words. One of the words in scan is sled. Now, we don't call it a sled anyway in the UK. We call it a sledge. Right. So actually, it's well known across people in the UK who use scan that we've got to make allowances for things like this as well. So even in the same language, right. you know, there's challenges anyway. Fantastic. Yeah. Right, and of course, being over here, we've got our own bias of, well, this is just the way it's done. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, that is hey, if you're creating it, why not? <laughs> well, well, that's true. You can't, you can't go Norman on every language and every accent all over. Yeah. Which, which, which yeah. raises an interesting point. Uh, and it does make me wonder, even if this, even within the scan community, if they've compared outcomes, let's say in New York City to the Southeast or the West Coast, with everybody having a different mm-hmm. accent. I don't know. And then when you said, "Oh, Doug, I thought it was simple. We're just going to take language out of the picture, and we're just going to put all the tests in one little measurement," but yet mm-hmm. you had to conceive that. Then you had to find a engineer in scotland then you found some guys over in germany so you make it sound simple enough but clearly you built quite a team for yourself to to make this instrument yeah i mean the the company that we worked with initially in germany are in this field anyway they were they were in this field of creating auditory testing equipment and things like that so they were they were a key point with without them i don't think we'd have been able to put it together so, you know, it, it came together nicely when it needed to. And one of the things I want to recognize is that there is some required training to go through to become a certified TAVS provider. I've, mm-hmm. I've been through that training several years ago. Um, I revisited some of that training recently in preparation for us coming to talking today and learned some new things yet again. But... But my point is that you don't have you don't have to be a speech pathologist or a licensed audiologist to become trained to use the TAVs. True enough. Yeah. Yep. No, thank you for bringing that up. And and I think there's two there's two things. Yeah, there. I I thought it was really important that it wasn't just that somebody could buy it and use it, because there are many different um, screening areas within TAVs. And 
you know, yes, there might be audiologists who will understand temporal order and fusion threshold and pitch discrimination, duration pattern, and, and all these things that, that are tested in there. But like with, like with many tests in this area, the important thing is to understand how to interpret the data that you see. So it's, it's really easy to use the testing equipment, but you know, to actually understand what you're seeing is very different. So I've, I've found that over the years, actually, with some of the tests I use, like SCAM. You know, I, I, didn't, I don't think there's a course to understand how to inter interpret SCAM. You've got to talk to other people and use it and learn it all yourself. So that was the reason for putting the course together as well, to actually say, look, yes, there's the research side of it, so we can throw some research papers in for each area, um, but also it's to say, you know, this is what it, this is what this auditory area links to, and also, of course, then it, it feeds into auditory programs like the listening program, you know, where it, it's a it's a wonderful pre post test. Yes for auditory therapies so we can actually you know going right back to the beginning where you said how what can we test and so yeah we can, we can test and find benefits then and i and i always find it interesting as a clinician as a practicing clinician to be able to do pre and post outcomes and those are important but it also has to be dovetailed with behavior outcomes on a day-to-day -day basis so it's nice to have a behavioral survey that you can that you can put some numerical value on and score it. Because yes, in a perfect world, we want behavioral outcomes to get better, tied in with our, an improvement in our clinical outcomes, because they both have to go hand in hand. Um, yes. We have to be able to prove the value of what we do. And I think that your instrument goes a long way to helping identify those needs and then changes in those outcomes when they're getting better. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about the TAVS instrument itself, particularly particularly the auditory side of it. Because if I understand things correctly, there's more normative data on the auditory side and not so much on the visual side of the instrument itself. True enough? Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. So, yeah, some of, we've, we've focused on auditory. Some of the areas do do a visual as well. But certainly, there isn't there isn't as much norm data available on the visual side because the research has just not been done. It seems. All right. So the TAVS instrument itself. Let's talk about the screening test to decide if you're a good candidate to even go through the testing itself. Um, which is yeah, it's it's um, sound with gaps and sound with gaps with a beep in is that one. So if you think of sort of white noise and then a gap and then white noise, the idea of the pretest is just to see if somebody can press the buttons and respond appropriately. So if it's a silent gap, you don't press the button. If there's a beep, you press the button. Um, and it will measure, you know, how quick you press the button and all this sort of thing. But essentially the pretest is to say, you know, can somebody press the button appropriately um, so that they can do the quick screening? Right. Yeah. And the thinking is, if you can't do the simple task like that, then there's no reason to conduct the rest of the testing because we're not going to be able to perceive that data as being clinically valuable because you struggle with just the concept of pressing those buttons when you hear a beep in the white noise versus not hear a beep. Yes, yes. So that's it. It is an important thing, yeah, and it and it it means absolutely, as you say, that if we can't do the pretest, um, you know, we we can't comprehend what's needed for the rest of it. So let's say that you're assessing someone who can't do the pretest. What do you think that really is representative of, and how far do we have to go down this developmental ladder before I might intervene with beat competency therapies or movement therapies like TMP or other movement programs, would it make sense that if you can't do the pretest that one of those other programs would be appropriate to start from? 
and or do you have an experience with understanding the nutritional side of that discussion, uh, especially about omega-3 fatty acids? Because that's a big one in this whole yes. arena. So if, Absolutely. if you can't do the pretest, what would you do for intervention? If we consider what's in the pretest, we the what we've got is the different tones that are in there. Some are a, a high pitch essentially, and some are a low pitch, and some are a louder volume than other ones. So we've actually got a, a, a combination of different signals coming through there. So I think you know if if we when we're saying can't do the pretest, it may well be that somebody is missing the high volume. Or, or, or more likely the low volume sounds and not pressing the button then. So th we, we need to look at the combination of results that we've got even for the pretest, because it may well be that it indicates somebody's got hearing loss. It, it may be inattention. Um, but if they just can't do the pretest, then my thought there would be you're, you're actually thinking about cognitive ability that if they can't understand or they they can't comprehend that they need to press the button when they hear a sound then you know there's a there's a real comprehension and cognitive challenge there um as to omega omega threes yeah there's I, I know there was a there was a big study done over in the uk um in the northeast of england some years ago with omega-3 showing the impact that that can have um, so yes, there's all sorts of all sorts of different areas can feed into it, but I don't just to, to to actually answer the question though that you were asking, I don't think we can really look at the pretest and 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 in a in a simplistic way say, well, if somebody can't do the pretest, then we should do this program. But we probably could do with other data. You know, if we're doing if we're doing visual assessment, we're doing reflexes, we're looking at developmental. Um, maybe a movement profile as well, then they would lead us more towards a therapy than the pretest on its own would. Right, right. We can't singularly look at the inability to do the pretest and think that we're going to use that to prescribe other therapy interventions. Yes, but I no. Also, but I also, like your, I also like, though, that your comment about, hey, there's a lot of information. Even if you can't do the pretest in the way that we want you to be able to, there's still data that's collected in the pretest high volume, low volume, high pitch, low pitch, that might have some diagnostic gems in the data, even if you can't successfully complete the pretest. So Absolutely. that's pretty cool. Let's presume that you have successfully completed the pretest. And I believe that there's a basic screening that has five different measures. Yes. And then there's the whole complete screening. Mm -hmm. That measures, is it 12 different areas? Yes. Now, most people very much do the quick screening uh, because I think when we start looking at the full screening, you're looking at at least an hour um, to do that anyway. So I mainly do the quick screening myself and pick out any couple of other bits that might be interesting depending what's in front of me. Let's talk about the quick screening. The first item in the quick screening, I believe it's temporal order. Is that right? Temporal order. Yes, temporal order indeed. Can you give the audience a quick description of, we'll go through the different items in the quick screening. We'll okay. give them a name and then we'll briefly define them so the audience understands what the heck we're talking about. Yes, absolutely. So temporal order is about how well we can sequence sound that's presented quickly. So if you imagine two clicks, one in your left ear, one in your right ear, and you've got headphones on, so the clicks will be presented either so that it's right, left, or left, right. So it's a simple concept. The, the, what's needed is to press the button where you hear the first click. Okay, so if the click goes left and then right, you just press the left button. Yep. Now, what temporal order is, is when you get the answer right, 
the two clicks will get closer and closer together in time until you get to a point where you are perceptually hearing one click or you can't tell which one's coming first, left or right. And that's what's called your temporal order threshold. Okay? So we can do that in, a, in an auditory with clicks. We can do it in a visual with flashes. Um, and we get a temporal order threshold, which you can look at the norms for different ages. And let's say we've got somebody who's 10 years old who've, who can't tell at a quarter of a second or 250 milliseconds whether a click comes in the left ear or the right ear first. Okay, So they would have temporal processing problems. Um, we'd hope, for, we'd hope, certainly by eleven, that we're getting around about seventy milliseconds. And, it, and if we can't tell two sounds apart at seventy milliseconds, then we know from the research available again that's all listed in the course that it's likely we'd have problems with reading, listening, speech, phonological awareness. Um, so these things are all around literacy and listening. Um, so temporal order is a, a really important well-known measure um, and it's very very simple to test and, and on a related note to the degree that that you might have difficulty with temporal ordering when the time between clicks starts to narrow and you end up with uh, listening issues and phonological issues and how that might tie into reading issues i think that also goes to the core perhaps of just doing more reading instruction and more instruction on phonological processing isn't going to go as well as it should, and it's going to take miles longer than it should, and it's probably not going to stick very well if you've got a, a temporal ordering processing challenge. Yes. I, I think this is the case with, with many of these that, you know, we're talking about assessing things at the level of the foundations of the house yes. rather than, rather than you know, is the roof sound or are the walls okay? You know, because we, we can all probably manage with a few bricks missing here and there. But, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, if the foundations are not there, you're going to struggle to get a wall up. Yes. That's all. Yep. We're talking about the foundational levels and everything else got to build on that. All right. Yeah. So let's go on and talk about fusion threshold. Can you give us a definition okay. for fusion threshold? Yeah. F fusion threshold is a, is a measure of what's called temporal resolution. Now, this is two clicks that are really close together. So we're not talking here, say, a quarter of a second apart, like we are in temporal order. We're talking about 10, 20 or less milliseconds. Now, how you hear this perceptually when you've got the headphones on and you get two clicks is if you get two clicks, one in the left ear, one in the right ear, simultaneously, perceptually, you will usually hear it in the center of your head. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you would respond to that as if it's one click. But if you get two clicks and they're a few milliseconds apart, then you should perceptually be able to realize that it's two clicks. So what fusion threshold asks you to do is say, is it one click or is it two? Um, and, they're, and they're delivered just a few milliseconds apart. So again, we might start off at 20 milliseconds and, and we're going, yep, yeah, that's two, that's two, that's two, that's two. And it gets closer and closer until we get to the point where it sounds like one. Are and the, that's our threshold. Again, right. and, and fusion threshold is, is a really interesting thing because I think when you think of speech as well and phonemes, what, what it's relatively straightforward to understand is that if we can't separate sound that's really close together and we are overlapping it, what happens is something called either forward masking or backward masking in speech. So we might have a word like cat, and the A might mask partly the C at the beginning. So actually, we're guessing as to whether somebody said cat or sat or bat or mat or rat. And we've got to take the clues in the whole sentence, you know, to understand the word, which is, of course, again, more takes more cognitive load. 
Um, so masking, masking is a really important part of what fusion threshold is about. Uh, and again, it's, you know, back to your really important point that if we've got somebody with a reading challenge and we just say, let's do more, doesn't help the auditory fusion, which is developmental. It doesn't help temporal order, you know, so, yeah. yeah. When, the, when the two clicks are presented, separated by a unit of time, is it always a right ear and a left ear click or are the clicks ever presented in the same ear? I think the answer I'd give you at this point is it's not necessary to put them either in, you know, in the same ear or a different ear. Well, um, I think in theory it should it shouldn't make a difference in theory. Yes, but I'm but I'm now thinking about how the eardrum might respond to two sounds that are uh, you know right. seven or eight milliseconds apart. So yeah, interesting thought that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's go on to the third item: auditory motor. Yep. So audi- auditory motor is something that's often often just called beat competency. Uh, again, we can do an auditory and a visual version of this. Um, and perceptually, you've got the headphones on. So there are just clicks in the ear that are like a metronome beat. Yep. What you're asked to do is listen, pick up the beat. And when I've got the beat in my head, press the buttons in time to the beat. Okay. So if you can pick up the beat, what will happen is slowly and gradually the beat will speed up. So you just press a little faster. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing is, you know, can I keep that beat? And you get a little margin of error on on either side as well for that. Um, So again, when when you get to a threshold level, that means that I can't really keep the beat anymore. It's it's too fast and I've lost the beat, so I can't press it. Um, and, And this, you know, beat competency is very closely linked to literacy and phonological awareness. And we also know from, from research done that this is, this is at brainstem level. You know, so if, if there's a challenge with beat competency, then the beat is not being perceived at the brainstem correctly. Um, and, and we also know from, again, people like Nina Krauss at Northwestern that this can be retrained. You know, so these are things, obviously, we, we're testing it with a view to improving it and then be able, being able to retest it. And and thank you for making that point, because we don't want to just measure things that you can't, we don't want to just measure things that we can't train. We want to know that we, we can make things better. Absolutely. So, that's the whole point. Isn't it? That's the whole yeah. point. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about pitch discrimination. Okay. Yeah. So this, as as it would sound, pitch discrimination is is, can you tell two sounds that are close together? So this could be or it could be, you know, so you're hearing, you're hearing two sounds in your head. And the question is which one's higher and which one's lower. And, and we just, you know, as we get them closer and closer together, the pictures, then it's more difficult. And, and we can find a threshold level where somebody maybe can tell doot, doot, is different, but they can't tell doot, doot, is different. Right. Well, so that's pitch discrimination. Um, and again, we know that pitch discrimination is closely linked to phonemic awareness. But when you look at a speech banana, um, for, for those people, you know, whether you're speech language pathologists or anything else, you can find speech banana on Google. We know that things like ch and ch and f and s are really close together in pitch. So if we can't discriminate pitch, it's likely that we'll have difficulty with phonemic awareness. And again, difficulties with listening and speech and language and literacy and just follow from there. Well, so again, pitch discrimination is quite simple, really. <laughs> and And what you've just said reminds me of another thing, too. Because if you have diffi- if you're one who has difficulty with the things that we're talking about and measuring, you, I would argue that you find listening exhausting. It's, yes, it's just too much mental work. Yeah, and then it becomes a a learned behavior not to pay attention, because hey, I have enough. I have a body of experience that when I listen and I'm missing half of what I'm hearing, 
and I'm exhausted trying to remember what I'm supposed to be listening to, well, you know what? I'm just not going to listen anymore because it's just too much work. And of course, that's the group that is, I think, wildly at risk of getting diagnosed with inattentive ADD yep. when we're not getting at the root cause of, it's like, well, is it because you can't move or you can't look or you can't listen? Yes. And of course, it's really it's really interesting when you look at attention that it's considered very much a top down process. You know, there are there are hair cells in the ear that change shape and focus attention. So we know there are top down mechanisms for attention. Absolutely. But we've also got to consider whether the bottom up signal is being received and processed by the brain. Well, so I think it. You know, for me, I, I I may just not have read or spoken to enough people, but I always find it difficult to pull apart auditory processing and attention right. because it's all all bound up together, even though they are slightly different processes in the brain. Well, and one of the other things that I find really intriguing is this body of work that uh, Dr. Stephen Porges has been writing about for 30 years as it relates to the polyvagal theory of affect, emotion, self-regulation, and communication. And one of the things I find intrigued by things that he has written about is that when your 10th cranial nerve is dysregulated, it it changes the tension on your eardrum. Yes. And And then I've been wondering for a while now about, well, like, how do we, how do we go about addressing that? Because if you're, if you're, Vagus nerve is dysregulated and it's affecting the tension on your eardrum and you're predisposed now to listen to ultra low frequency sounds, things that we're measuring um, higher up in these frequencies, I don't think you're going to hear as well if if we've altered the tension on your eardrum and made it harder for you to hear those sounds. Oh. Yeah, that's a, such a huge area as well. When, when we start bringing in Porges' work and, and the vagus nerve, oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause I think, yeah, because there, there, are, there are multiple things there. You know, if, if we can calm down the system and get more vagal tone, then that will help with relaxation. And therefore, yes, you know, if the eardrum's working more effectively, it'll help with listening. And of course, the the important thing about the eardrum is it, it protects our ear from loud sounds by by tightening up when there's a loud sound, but also it amplifies the speech range frequencies. Um, so you know, big listening actions there, of course. Well, and I think one of the reasons that optometrists that practice the way I do are intrigued by the auditory system as well is because I can change how calm somebody's nervous system is with prisms or low plus lenses or colors yes now i i currently don't have the tools to measure the tension on the eardrum but i wish i did because if (laughs) i did i would say okay let's measure the tension on your eardrum as a representation perhaps of how your vagus nerve is regulating your outcomes and then i'm going to put lenses of prism color or some combination and go back and measure this tension because I know, I know that we're affecting things in this manner because when I do these uh, lens trials in the office, it's, it's frequent that people's touch sensitivity goes down. Their sound sensitivity goes down and their breathing becomes calmer, and they can get a bigger volume of breath and a calmer breath just by me putting on lenses. Yes. It's so fascinating. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the links between the visual and the auditory system are so clear. Oh, and there's... Uh, the, uh, yeah. Uh, the, um, the visual specialists I work with over here, you know, we, we all agree you can you can alter... The auditory system through vision, and you can alter the vision visual system through auditory. Yeah, and, and that's without even talking about the vestibular again. So it's, you know, it's, we are one system, aren't we? All right. So we've got, I think, one more uh, measurement in the quick screening, and that's duration oh, yes. pattern. Yeah. Yes, duration pattern. 
So again, this I think this is quite a straightforward idea. Um, we've got three sounds. Um, they're all the same pitch. The question is, which one is the longest? So you might hear in your headphones, doo, doo, doo. so you'd know sound one was the longest, or it might be doo, doo, doo. sound two being the longest. So you have a choice of three buttons. You press first, middle, or last. Um, and that's that's duration pattern. And now, again, this, this is very much about uh, an, another element of timing. So a lot of the things we've already talked about with temporal order and with fusion threshold and actually with auditory motor, you know, very similar. If we have problems with duration pattern, then we'll have problems with phonological awareness, listening, literacy, speech and language. In summary today, I just want to acknowledge that I've had the TAVS device in my office for several years, and I went out and got trained in it subsequent to becoming a music listening therapist because I wanted something tangible and concrete that I could measure. Now, we've, we've discussed that throughout the episode today, but to wrap things up, Alan, who do you think are the good candidates for who might need the TAVS testing? I, I think, Doug, age-wise, age firstly, um, some five- and six-year-olds will be able to access it, but you're probably looking at seven or eight years old upwards um, to, be, to be able to actually go through the testing anyway. But in terms of the categories of, of people who will benefit from this type of testing, it, it would be anybody with listening challenges, um, anybody with labels like dyslexia, um, DCD, you know, who can go through this type of testing. Because what, we, what we're looking at is to see if we can get to the fundamentals of why somebody is having difficulty with listening and attention and literacy and reading. It, um, I, I think it goes back then to that big group of labels, developmental coordination disorder, dyslexia, dysgraphia, perhaps dyscalculia, dyspraxia, somebody who's been described as having an attention issue, whether it's ADHD or inattentive ADD. It's that big group of labels. Oh, yeah. Autism spectrum. That describes yeah. behaviors, but not addressing the root causes. Yes. Once again, Alan, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. It is a great pleasure, Doug. It's been fabulous fun. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi. All of the resources mentioned in this podcast and links to learn more about our guest can be found in the episode notes from whichever podcast app you might be listening with. You'll also find a link to Dr. Steffi's website, which is steffioptometry.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-Y optometry.com. You can also call the office at 626-332-4510. We'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Audible. If you love podcasts, you'll love listening to audiobooks with Audible. Many of the books mentioned here in the podcast can also be found at Audible. Dr. Steffi has a free audiobook waiting for you as a gift just for listening to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. Simply click the link in the show notes to audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. Sign up for a free 30-day membership trial and you can download any audiobook you like. And if for any reason and at any time you choose to cancel your membership, you get to keep all of your audiobook downloads. It's risk-free and for free for 30 days. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. We really do appreciate you listening. And until next time, for Dr. Steffi of the Move, Look, and Listen podcast, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.